Welcome to the second ever episode of the Zebra People podcast, where we'll be sitting with design, tech, and product leaders to unlock the secrets of building high-performing product and design functions. Today, I'm joined by another good friend, Nick Marucci. Nick is uh, 15 years into his design career, uh, spent the last few leading teams, uh, including for, uh, how do you describe Bud, what they do? Uh, open banking APIs. Open banking APIs. Artificial intelligent, transactional artificial intelligence, I would say. Scale up. Yeah, scale up. Yeah. Nice tongue twister for you there. <laughs> um, but now also is an instructor for Experience House, helping to, to mentor the next generation of design talent. So thank you for joining us today. Um, in particular, there's a... There's an article that you posted a couple of months ago now entitled uh, Team Full of Jacks, which is the, the, the area that I think we're going to dive into most today. Okay. But to get us started, let's get to know you a little bit better sure. so that everyone else knows who you are. Um, with my first question, which is the question I'm asking everybody, when did you first get into design or when did you first know that design was the career path for you and why? Yeah, good question. Uh, I guess it was just, it was natural, really. Uh, it was the only thing that I was really into at school. So it was graphics at the time. Um, it was the only homework I ever did. I mean, I was pretty good at school anyway. I was quite lucky. I was quite uh, good. But um, in terms of like um, subjects and stuff, but graphics was the only one I'd sit down and do, do the homework and spend like one or two hours, which would infuriate my parents because they'd be like, well, if you, if you, if you did you know, the same level of uh, work that you do for graphics for other subjects, you'd be flying. You'd be laughing. But, you know. I had so, exactly the same thing at school, funnily enough. So I guess I kind of always knew I was going to do something creative. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And then when, at what point did that kind of deviate into more design as it is today rather than graphic design? So I, uh, I left school at six, 16 and did a BTEC, a uh, national diploma BTEC in graphic design and advertising. Uh, and... Um, yeah, that's where I found out about advertising. I'd always, I always loved coming up with ideas. And uh, when I found out I could actually get a job just coming up with ideas, I was like, I've got to do advertising. And that led me to uh, go to Bucks uh, Advertising School, which is a really good advertising school. Okay. Well, this has already started to get into the second question, which is just briefly summarising your career up to date um, for, for everyone that, again, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily know you. Sure. Uh, I know it's 15 years, yeah. so we don't have to go into too much detail. Um, so I did, I did start off uh, in advertising, um, did a few kind of placements and stuff. Um, didn't quite work out. It's a tough industry to get into. Um, and my actual first paid job was, was teaching. Uh, I went back to my old college um, where my, my, tutor, my first tutor there, uh, John Gay, gave me a call and said, you know, come and come, you know, you're not working at the moment, come and teach. And he, he got me to teach these um, 14 to 16 year old kids who didn't really want to do graphic design, were, were having, were, weren't doing well in school. And so there was a kind of um, a connection with the school and the college. And uh, he was like, right, here's a curriculum, go and teach these kids. And I remember the first day looking through the, through the window, the class and going, oh my God, what the hell have I let myself in, in for? And I went in and they were shouting and screaming and a scalpel went missing. And it's just like, oh my God, this is going to be terrible. First couple of lessons were tough. But then what I realized was that I could, if I could connect with what their interests were, I could get them to learn. So, you know, if someone was really interested in trainers or someone was in, interested in like, um, uh, I don't know, cars, I could use those interests and get them to kind of then, you know, come up with logos, come up with a shop design, come up with, um, you know, packaging, you know. So it was, it was, it was, it kind of taught me that the best way to kind of, coach people is to kind of really connect with what their, what their interests are and what their dreams are. Mm. Okay, interesting. So then from there, from what there. was next? From there, my first job as a graphic designer was uh, working at Westminster City Council. So working in local government, uh, really kind of low budget. You kind of had to do everything, illustrating, illustration, photography, uh, desktop publishing, posters, campaigns for the West End. Uh, we worked on lots of different stuff. Um, that's where I started to kind of get an interest in, in, in digital design. Um, that we didn't do much work there, but um, what I did was kind of started getting a few kind of side hustles while I was working full time as a graphic designer because I wanted to get more into digital design. Um, and I, I'd say that's, you know, 
if you've got the time to do it, side hustles are a really, really good way of learning. Yeah. Um, you know, because you've got to do everything, right? Mm. You've got to do consulting, you've got to do negotiation of pricing, you've got to present, you've got to do all the work. Um, it's a really good way. It kind of, it, 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 you know, I learned so much through doing that from like people just saying, can you do my website? And I'd be like, uh, yeah, okay. And then suddenly I was getting e-commerce websites, which are, you know, massive websites. And I was trying to do them in Photoshop and I made loads of mistakes. It was really scary, but it really kind of helped me progress. And I brought that back into my work, did the first digital guidelines for Westminster, got involved in um, a website redesign project with an external agency, Matter, who came in, um, managed to get myself involved in that because it wasn't part of our remit. But, you know, one of the things you kind of learn quite quickly is you've got to kind of negotiate the politics and culture mm. in a company to really sometimes get yourself into these good projects or get good design done. So I managed to kind of get into that project. And uh, their whole way of working was all based on government digital services, uh, lean startup methodology. Yeah. And I remember walking in to the room um, and just seeing post-it notes all over the wall. And I was just like, wow. Ooh. And uh, they, they ran a workshop, cross-functional workshop, and they were going through journeys, you know, saying like, if someone comes to um, uh, the government website, you know, and they want to find out, you know, when the recycling day is, what do they do? What steps do they take? Or if they want to pay for a parking ticket, what steps do they take? And it was so simple, but it just blew my mind. And I was like, I've got to w work in this kind of environment. I've got to work as a, whatever it was called at the time. It, it, there wasn't really names. It was like visual designer, UI designer. And then it became like kind of UX. Product design didn't exist didn't at exist that time, then. right? Yeah. Even UX didn't exist. So I kind of threw myself into that project, worked with that team, and then uh, they offered me a job. So I joined Matter, um, who were kind of a customer experience agency, quite a small startup. And we were working with lots of big companies, um, Hertz Magazine, uh, Amia, that was part of like Nectar Card, um, Paddy Power. And we were running innovation workshops, like rapid prototyping with customers, co-creating, like it was all about facilitating workshops, uh, using lots of uh, frameworks like business model canvas, value proposition canvas. I was learning all about this kind of stuff. Uh, and that's really kind of where I really honed my facil facilitation skills, which I think is a massive part of, of, of being, a, being a designer. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I joined the OVO. Um, and uh, I joined a kind of special projects team at OVO. And we, we uh, built a... One of, one of the UK's first app-only energy uh, apps. Uh, awesome. it, was all, it was a little bit at the same time as like Monzo uh, and Starlin were coming out. So and we wanted to kind of do something similar, but for the energy market, uh, all completely self-serve with an app. Um, and joined that team from the beginning. They had no brand, no name, no product, nothing. And it was just like from the start, um, which was great. You know, we scaled it, you know, in, within like six months, like 20,000 plus customers, and then it got wow. bought into Ovo proper. And then after that, I uh, joined Bud um, as a kind of their first kind of UX lead, uh, which quickly kind of the role quickly progressed into more kind of design operations and uh, then leading the design team and restructuring that team and scaling that team and, and pushing design upstream as well, because design when I came in was very much doing product marketing. Mm. And... By the time I'd left, we were we had designers working in the API uh, teams, building the kind of working with them to kind of build the the API logic and how that worked. So we'd gone from product marketing to actually designing the products that we were shipping. And I left Bud in March, and since then I've just been consulting with uh, a couple of startups. So working with a voice uh, AI startup at the moment. So that's kind of. That's kind of where you're at That's now. That's my journey, yeah. Going back to Bud, before we dive into the key topic of, of this conversation, you mentioned there that obviously when you joined, it was kind of product marketing, and then you helped to really push it and embed it a little bit more into the business. Yeah. What did you find was the most effective way to, to actually get that to happen? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, you've got to understand, like I said earlier, the culture and the politics of the place. And, you know, you can't just go in there and say, right, we should have designers working on the products we're shipping, even though that's, that's an obvious uh, thing, right? Um, I guess one of the, it was kind of glorified product marketing in a way, but we also had the Bud app, which was used as a kind of testing 
like a, a product to kind of test the APIs we were building out in the market. We can test and learn with it. And I think there was, you know, we started having conversations where we wanted to build a certain experience, but then would come up against the API wouldn't be able to do it. And I was like, well, okay, there's something missing here. There's a link missing here. The API won't allow us to build the experience we really want to build. Mm. So who's designing these APIs? Who's thinking about how they're going to be used? Uh, and so the most effective thing for me to do to kind of help kind of coach people uh, was to grab kind of senior developers and stuff, get them, in a, get them in a room with a whiteboard and a marker and just say, can you draw out this API and tell me just how it works? Really simple way, just boxes and arrows. Like forget all the complicated talk because, uh, you know, it's the Einstein saying of, you know, if you can't explain something simply, you don't really under understand, understand it, it, right? Yeah. Um, and so just try to simplify it. And it's a really good method, actually. I like to do it with really senior people as well because it, it humbles them. You know, like you, know, you get CEOs or senior people and they like to kind of talk and sometimes they use complicated words. And you think, okay, but do you really know what you're saying? And can you say it in a way that anyone can understand it? And I, I like to play the stupid, the dumb person, yeah. right? And ask the stupid questions just so the clarity is there. Because what I'm always striving for is, is complete clarity. You know, until you've got that, it's difficult to get people on the same page. So just giving them a pen and saying, okay, can you draw that out for me? They just, they just start to shake a little bit. They go, oh my God, well, I don't know how to draw this. And it's like, well, if it's that simple, you know, you should be able to draw it. Yeah. And so they started to draw out these APIs and you could see that another developer go, well, no, that's not how it works. Oh no, actually. And then you see that, well, there was, there was obviously a couple of links missing. And then in terms of the value that it brought, that was the key bit. I was like, okay, so you've got the API gives you this. Then what? What, what? what do we want people to do with that information? What, yeah. what value do we want to create for the user? What outcomes do we want to create? And I think it was, uh, it, was, it was driving them towards that that then made them think, okay, well, actually, we need to do a bit of work here. We yeah. need to think about the outcomes a little bit more that we want to achieve for business. And so the value of that process really and helped to bring a bit more alignment across those Don't teams. get me wrong, it wasn't easy and, and <laughs> there was loads of um, humps along the way and stuff. But it never is. Yeah. Yeah, it never no. is. What has been the biggest challenge you've overcome in your career so far? I would say uh, it's difficult to kind of pick one, but I'd say one of them that I say, I'd say has kind of happened along the way is imposter syndrome, I think. Because... You know, I've had it at a few times. I guess uh, you have it a little bit sometimes when you're when you're working on projects. You think, "Oh God, how the hell am I going to solve this problem and stuff?" You know, and they always say, "Like, you know, it's darkest before the dawn," and it's it's actually very true. Sometimes you kind of get into those dark moments, and you think, "How the hell am I going to get through this?" But actually, you know, then then you do. You always do. It always be better. Yeah. Um, but I'd say uh, matter uh, just because you know being thrown in the deep end doing facilitation and, and, and learning about the lean startup model. And it almost like broke me and put me back together again and turned me into a different sort, sort of designer. Mm. Um, and then at Ovo, because I was the only designer and we had nothing and I had to start from the beginning, I felt like so much pressure that I was the only designer and I had to come up with the brand and the name and the product and the design and we had no design system. Uh, and what I learned over time was that I didn't, I didn't need to come up with all of that. Um, I needed to help bring the team and the problem into the problem space and use them as well. Right. Developers are great designers, you know, they come up with great like, the product manager and stuff like that. Yeah. So I would say one of the things is like that helped me through bouts of kind of imposter syndrome is, is, is take the pressure of yourself and give you, I think even though you're the designer, you don't have to come up with it. You can be designer as facilitator. And yeah. empower people to come up with ideas. And then the other thing is you kind of almost have to tackle it head on and kind of think, well, why am I feeling like this? What is it that I think I don't know? And then just try and learn it. Try and learn it until you have the confidence to think, oh, actually, I do know it, you know? And yeah. then sometimes that's the best way to get over it, I'd say. Yeah, which is really, but I mean, a lot of people struggle with imposter syndrome at various stages yeah. in their career, right? Um, and that's really, really powerful advice, to be honest with you. Um, okay. So coming on to the article, yep. for the audience who might not have seen it yet, but we will have a link in the, in the description, uh, what exactly is a team full of jacks? So it's a, <laughs> a team full of jacks is basically a team of um, multidisciplinary designers that have multiple skills um, that don't necessarily have specialisms, right? 
So uh, a jack of all trade, you know, in the article, I kind of it's a little bit of a play on words and stuff, but I, I kind of refer to the the term, you know, jack of all trades is sometimes used as a bit of a put down mm. for people. Um, but actually, the full quote that most people don't know uh, that I say at the end is, a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. Yeah. So it's Which, actually not. Interestingly, your article was the first time I heard that full the full version. I know. <laughs> uh, so we're forced a lot of times to pick a specialism in design. I think I think there's a bit of a flaw there, you know, um, that you've got to you've got to pick a specialism, something you're really good at. But you know, startups, scale ups, entrepreneurship, uh, leadership. You know, you've got to you've got to know quite a lot about everything. You know, and so you know, having one specialism, I don't think helps you scale to the kind of that leadership position. But also if you want to ever run your own business or you want to work for startups and startups and scale ups, you've, you've got to put on many hats. Mm. Uh, and so it kind of, it kind of embraces that. And I think that labels can limit us and it's about getting people to think more with a kind of growth mindset to think, well, actually, you know, I don't have to just be, you know, a specialist in UX and not learn about UI, you know, um, and obviously there's this kind of theory of a T-shaped designer um, and a lot of people talk about T-shaped designers, but what a T-shaped designer basically says is, is you've got one area of depth and then everything else is just like basic knowledge, mm. which, is, which is a strange idea and one that uh, Jared Spool challenges. And I quote Jared Spool uh, in the article because it's his, it's his kind of theory of, of a broken comb that uh, I really like and I'll talk about in a sec. Um, but a T-shaped designer suggests that you can only be really good at one thing, but that's like saying you can't learn Spanish and guitar at the same You can only do one. You, do, you, mean, you can, yeah. human beings are, are remarkable. We can learn so much stuff. We can, at the same time, our, our brains have so much capacity to, to learn. As long as you value something, you'll find time to do it. Um, and what a broken comb shape instead of the t-shape suggests is that you could be actually pretty good or very good at lots of different things and maybe not so good at some stuff but you know you kind of you're like a broken comb you know you're not perfect no human being is, is a perfect t-shape we're all we're all broken combs basically which makes sense and actually this is why i wanted to get you on to talk a bit more about this because as soon as i read it, it it does make sense mm. and it's actually a big debate in in the industry i suppose that constantly goes back and forth in terms of specialisms versus generalists or broad, not even necessarily generalists right just broader experience yeah uh, even when product designer as a term came in it was a big debate as to whether that was allowed because you know before that ux and ui was a lot more separate yeah. um and it's slowly overlapped a lot more um so let's talk about that broken comb a little bit more. I'm not saying that people shouldn't be specialists and stuff, right? Yeah. I think what I'm saying is that, um, I know you're not challenging me saying that, I'm not saying that, but like, I think it depends on the company you work for as well, right? The bigger the company, the more I think you get, you have specialisms, like, mm. you know, content writers, UX writers. I think they're like, yes, that's a specialism, but that's also a very good skill to have. And if you can, if your company can do it, then bringing someone like that in is, is really important. Right now, with the industry the way it is and the market the way it is, the more skills you have and the less specialist you are and the more kind of broader your skills or the more specialisms you have, the more uh, opportunity you have to kind of navigate the kind of the yeah. choppy waters that we're in at the moment. If you're a design leader and you're working in a kind of place that needs that flexibility, uh, I think, you know, there is a lot of benefits of building a team of jacks. You know, the flexibility is one, right? You're not, you're not, you know, you've got multiple projects going on. You don't have to have one person. You know, if I use a sports analogy, I, was, I coach a girls football team. Um, what I try and do is, 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 is coach them to be flexible so they can play multiple positions. That's good for them because then they don't have to play as a defender. But it's also good for the team because then you can move people around. You don't have just one girl playing uh, defence all the time and that's the only position she can play. She can play defence, she can play up. You know, it's almost like Dutch total football. You mm -hmm. know, it's like you can play in lots of different positions and you can wear many hats. And I think that's what projects are like, you know, mm -hmm. projects, especially with collaboration, you know, you should be able to kind of just, you know, uh, help each other out and have different roles. Um, the other benefit as well is you can do pair design and you can pair people that have different specialisms together. So it becomes more effective, but also it's a great way of them learning off each other. So if I'm really good at UX, 
uh, but not so good at UI, and you're really good at UI, but not so good at UX. Let's pair together, let's work on a project, even if it's just an hour or two a week to help each other out on the projects we're working on. But we'll, through osmosis, we'll learn from each other mm. and I'll improve my UI skills. You can teach me about auto layout and I'll teach you about, um, you know, doing a customer journey map or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, service design map or something like that, you know? Um, and I think the, the quality of the work improves as well. Yeah. Within that model, do you find that there are any limitations within the different skill sets people can learn? So, for example, if someone comes from much more of a graphic design sort of background, are there certain skills they typically find more difficult to pick up, like the details of, of research or vice versa? People that come from much more psychology backgrounds, as an example, struggle with the, the visual end. Um, or have you found that anyone can be trained in any one of those arms? Uh, yeah, I don't see any limitations in anyone. I think my, my mindset is always to kind of think the like that anyone can can achieve anything if they really want to do it right you can't force people to mm. kind of go down a certain route it's got to be part of what they want to do as well um but you know I, I, when i had a team at bud uh there were there were people that had multiple backgrounds backgrounds from psychology is great to be a natural ux designer but i, I also really like product designers that have a background in industrial design uh because they think about research in a really good way. Yes, visually they might not be the best, but they think about things, methodolo the methodology yeah. and stuff. They, can, they, the they follow it naturally. And then you've got designers that come from more of a creative background. And it, what they bring is just that, that spark and creativity and ideas and uh, that kind of methodology as well, which, you know, it's all, it all kind of contributes. Yeah. And you need that diversity in a team, really, um, to, like you say, plug in the different gaps where some people might be stronger and others might not. Um, that's what builds the, the strength in the team. Um, okay. So within, actually, on the subject of building the strength in, within the team, you talk a lot about growth mindset and you even mentioned it just a minute ago. Um, talk me through how you actually instill that within a team to, to help them progress. Yeah. It, it really depends on, I think the first thing depends on if you inherit a team versus if you're building your own team, right? So if you inherit a team, you can't just go in and kind of change, change minds and, you know, and when, you, when you're building a team, different, you know, you partner up with someone like yourself and you build a team, right? And you look for certain attributes. Um, but if I think about when I came in at Bud, um, you know, the, the structure of the team needed, needed a bit of work and there were some, some people that were maybe used to working on their own. So being more like lone wolves mm. um, and you had to try and help them understand that working in the open and collaborating was beneficial for them and for the team and, and the company. Um, and you had to kind of help them understand that, yeah, it might feel like it's faster to work on your own and being a bit of a lone wolf and then just do the big bang reveal. But actually mm. it's, it's faster overall if you, if you work collaboratively. Um, so one of the first things I kind of had to establish was, was a design crit. And I think most, most companies do it now, design crits. But um, you'd be surprised though, because I mean, I'm, uh, I'm currently teaching at um, a UX bootcamp uh, experience house. And, uh, you know, we were talking about it last night with the students and they've all come from, most of them from design backgrounds and they're working in design, but they're, they're just moving into kind of product design. Uh, mm. But most of, but half of them probably had never done a design crit or even knew what a design crit was. And you kind of think, what are colleges and unis and what are they doing? You know, because a design critique is like the foundation of, 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 of good design in a way. You know, you, know, you, you, you learn to kind of uh, have your work critiqued, mm. you know, and you also learn to rationalize your design decisions. You know, like that's, that's like fundamental. And communicate stuff. them. And communicate them. Like, yeah. You know, and so the first thing was establishing that and getting people comfortable with that, getting people comfortable with having their work critiqued by another person and teaching them how to critique properly. Uh, and then kind of following that up with, you know, what are you going to, you know, what have you learned from what people yeah. have critiqued and how do you take that forward? And then what I did at, at Bud was actually create an open design crit. So open to the company because I wanted to kind of raise the design IQ of the company. And I also wanted to kind of break down some of the barriers that was 
that are developed in the design team to kind of go, no, let's open it up. Let's let's show people what the design process is like. And let's let's welcome ideas and thoughts from products, from marketing, from engineering, from around the kind of business. Mm. And and learn to have a have a have a thicker skin and, and learn to kind of um embrace that kind of openness sort of thing. Um and sharing work is super important as well. And what I find is sometimes senior designers can be the ones that don't want to share as much as juniors. And that's a big, that's a big problem. You know, if, if you have senior designers that are kind of a little bit like... Do you think that's because they think, oh, you know what, I know what I'm doing. I'm confident. I can just get it done. Whereas the juniors are seeking approval or is it just a, a general... I just got it, my head down and just... It depends on the person. I think sometimes... I see seniors that uh, maybe have imposter syndrome or perhaps uh, a little bit worried of exposing themselves. Mm. The thing is, it's all about building vulnerability yeah. and breaking down egos. And we've all got a bit of an ego, right? We, you have to kind of be aware of it and, and think about how to kind of navigate it. And you have, if you have a senior designer that's a little bit feeling a little bit vulnerable and doesn't want to expose themselves, that's a problem for them, but it's also a problem for the team because junior designers look at them and go, oh, okay, well, if they're not sharing their work. Why should I share? You know, because the junior designer is always going to kind of look at. Yeah. How do, you, how, do you coach, how do you coach those seniors that might have, you know, whether it be imposter syndrome or whatever, for whatever reason, they're not opening up about their own work or sharing that with the team? I, f- I think, um, I, obviously, it depends again, but. Uh, you, you know, I think it, you have to you have to try and help them understand that that they know what they're doing, they're good, and reinforce that. Have that have that reinforcement that that they're in a senior position and they're in a senior position for a reason, and then to kind of also highlight to them because sometimes it's just just you're not aware, just the awareness that look, there's people looking up to you, looking up to your behaviour, and your behaviour is super super important. Um, one of the ways I managed to do that at Bud was uh, I uh, created a thing called a, the book club. And so every Friday afternoon, uh, we would uh, read a design book or we'd read a design book and every Friday afternoon, we'd go through the chapter uh, and talk about it. Uh, and I picked a couple of books, specific books. So one was uh, Lean UX um, because it talks a lot about kind of behaviours of a designer and how to work with different people. And these were the kind of values I wanted people to to start showing but instead of i knew it wasn't going to work just to tell people this is what i wanted to start doing especially the more senior ones um but i wanted them to come to it themselves and so the book club allowed us to you know talk about design talk about the ideas in the books you know debate it and then together what we started to create naturally was like a shared language and a shared way of working which then actually ended up becoming a group like a um free principles or free values as a team and um we create those three values which are like energy trust and uh, curiosity which kind of helped us to kind of create that kind of bond with those three values then obviously that's within the team how did you find the wider business responded to those three values because you talked about bringing like the wider parts of the business into design crits and that kind of stuff did they also abide by they, those same three pillars or was that a bit different no we, uh, the company had their own the company had their own values as well mm. uh, these were just more team ones and yeah. the reason why i wanted to to kind of instill our own team ones was because um, we, I felt like we needed some kind of foundation, some foundation in place to kind of help everyone kind of move in the same direction and, and, and have a work in the kind of way that I wanted us to work. Um, but, it, but again, it didn't come from me. I didn't say, here's our values. It, like, we did a workshop after a few months at a book club. We said, okay, like, you know, we talk about all this stuff, but how, do, how can we kind of group all these thoughts into like three things that help us, A, think about the way we work, and how we want to kind of uh, work together and B, help us to look for these values when we're hiring. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so energy, the first one was, it's not just about positive energy. It's about kind of, you know, design is hard, it's difficult. And, you know, sometimes we have to energize each other. And it's a little bit like the kind of Japanese theory of flow and, you know, always kind of moving forwards and, 
and tried to help each other. And like there, there are pe- there can be times where people have be- egos, for example, example can sap energy, and you, you don't want that. You want to kind of instill energy in people and help people yeah. kind of through tough tough projects. Um, the other one is trust, and that kind of came, I guess, that came a lot from the time as well. So we'd just gone into lockdown and working from home and there was an element of trust in that sense, uh, but also an element of trust in kind of trusting each other to be open with each other. Like what I really, really was trying to get the seniors to do was to say openly, I don't know about this, so I'm not very good at this. Does anyone, you know, could anyone help me with this sort of thing? Mm. Um, and that, that, that would immediately kind of make them like show their vulnerability, which would help the juniors and stuff. And and to be honest, I, I needed to do that as well. So, um, yeah, one of my favorite things to do is to like throw myself in a bit of design work and then get them to critique my work. And obviously they, they enjoyed that yeah. because it was their opportunity <laughs> to, to just rip, rip into you. Yeah, yeah. And obviously I was doing like rubbish designs. So of course. Of, you know, like, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but I had to do that as well to show, look, I can take it. Like, I'm not just preaching here. Like, you know, I've got to take criticism and mm. not, and, and it's not like I wasn't creating a, a, an environment where you just critique, you know, it's always challenging each other, but it was like, it's just yeah. open. Like, you know, you're not, you're falling in love with a problem, not the solution, you know, and it's, it's, it's about that really. And then the third one is, is my favorite is curiosity. Cause I, I don't think anything happens really without a little bit of curiosity. You know, you've got to be curious about stuff. Yeah. You've got to be curious about things to kind of chat, to question them and to understand how they work and how they could work better. Curious to kind of step, step out of your comfort zone, curious to kind of um, move a- across to the com- across the company and, and, and not be restricted by your job role and, and try and work with people like customer services and uh, customer success or marketing and, and, you know, really kind of want to understand more about the business. Another thing I, I introduced as well was something called uh, Reflection Fridays. Um, and what Reflection Fridays was, was an opportunity for people to, in the, in the design team, to say what they'd learned that, that week um, and what, you know, what, what they'd learned and what they were grateful for. And it kind of helped us as a team kind of connect a bit more. And again, it kind of, uh, increase that kind of vulnerability, openness, mm. you know, to really kind of share with each other. Like, you know, there's stuff that we, we thought we didn't know and then we, we learn and stuff that, you know, like, we, you, you know, even just really grateful for, for, for this person for helping me out when mm. I didn't know this thing. And, and that, that kind of, again, helped to kind of increase that yeah. kind of... Uh, it's always an interest. How did, you, how did you keep engagement in that kind of activity long term? And the reason I asked that question is we actually did a similar thing at Zebra for a period of time. Uh, and after a few weeks, people would just come to the meeting. It just became like a going through the motions kind of thing of just like, oh, we'll call out something and it's the end of the week and we all just want to get out of here and then we're done. How did you keep that more of like a we're actually here to, to share ideas and, and build as a team kind of process? Yeah, I mean, as a design leader, you're constantly trying to kind of keep the energy up and kind of trying to measure what's working and what's not. And like, for, for, we didn't, I didn't do that for that long um, because I ended up leaving. And so I don't know if that kind of carried on, but for example, the open design crits, mm. we had to change them after a while. The company matures, thing change, things change, the culture changes. You kind of think, okay, this is feeling a bit tired now. You you can't be scared to um, to change stuff. And also, the other thing I think I would say is is sometimes hand over the responsibility to someone else. Mm. So you yeah, okay, you're the, you're you're head of design or design leader. You you can start this stuff, but maybe after a few months, give it to a senior designer or give it to someone else and let them run it and take and change it and run with it. And you'll see that sometimes they just end up doing it better than you do. And or they give it a new twist and gives it new energy and people, it's refreshed and it's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, going back to the growth mindset that you instilled into the team. Yep. So what impact on the team's development did you see instilling that growth mindset had? I think uh, the main thing I would say is it created awareness. So what we did is we set up this... So we had the broken comb and we, we kind of turned it into like a circle. So it's almost like spikes. And so each person had their own shape. 
Yeah. And what we did was uh, we, we, we made people um, do a bit of a self-assessment. So we said, you know, Sam, you know, how good in terms of these levels, we gave them levels and stuff, do you think you are on kind of UI design? Like a spider diagram. Yeah, yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, like product strategy, um, you know, user research, usability testing. Um, and you would assess yourself. And then we'd also then get your colleagues to assess you as well. Um, and then I would sit down with each person individually and we'd look at the gap. You know, I'd, I'd say the more senior you are, the less you rate yourself as well. Mm. You kind of put yourself down a bit more. And the more junior you are, the higher you, you put yourself. And so, you know, sometimes it's a bit of a, an eye opener for people to go, oh, actually, most of your colleagues and myself have kind of put you at level two here, but you think you're level four. And then we talk about that. You know, it's not an art, it's not science, it's more of an art in that sense. Uh, we'll talk about that and we'll kind of try and identify what we think they were lacking in those skills. And so they had that kind of awareness. And then together we would sit down and it would form part of their kind of personal development or, you know, career progression as well, right? Uh, and we'd say, well, as a business, Sam, I need you to be better in these areas and you want to be better in, you know, this area and stuff. So let's kind of concentrate on these two. Ideally, you would want to be better in, in the same area that we need you to be better in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would work. Sometimes we would negotiate and, and think about like, how do we kind of bridge, bridge the gap, basically. So I'll say awareness is the main thing. Okay, awesome. And then within the article, you also talked about using those maps to sort of almost build a team map with that same thing, right? Um, and that influenced how you would then scale that team wherever you might need to as well. Yeah, it became a really good tool to communicate with stakeholders as well. Key, you know, senior stakeholders to say, look, um, right, we're looking to scale the team. If you look at the, sh the shape of the team, we're light in service design, you know, or we were losing a person and you, you'd go, right, here's a team map with this person. Here's a team map without. You can see we're starting to lose that kind of um, expertise in, 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 in user research, you know? So that next person we get, they need to be power, you know, they need to be good, powerful in that, in that space. So it's a really good way of communicating with, you know, uh, recruiters like yourself or, or mm. just internally to kind of get people on the same page and say, this is the kind of shape of person we're looking for here. Yeah, and the skills gaps within the team and, yeah. and what you need to plug. Makes sense, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so the last three questions, we, we like to round these out more as like advice for, for the market. Uh, what are some of the key skills and attributes that you look for when you're hiring a designer? Yeah, well, the first Which one... Which obviously links to, that, to that, that skills assessment a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, the first one for me is uh, curiosity. I've mentioned it a couple of times. That's my favourite one. Uh, like, I'm always, I'm always interested when I'm talking to people, like, how curious are they? And what questions do they ask? And how do they ask those questions? I think, I think that's super important. And then f also how they break down a problem. So, you know, um, how they think about things critically and, you know, are they really interested in solving problems, you know, and business problems as well. You know, I think, mm. that, I think that's, that, that for me are the kind of key attributes I kind of look for. Obviously with curiosity, you can tell from the kinds of questions that they're asking. But with the other, is there anything that tends to be a, a telltale sign that, that gives that away? Beyond I think, uh, yeah, so they will talk about, um, I think when they talk about their work, they will talk about the kind of value that mm -hmm. is bought, you know, what the outcomes were, or, you know, do they care about what the outcomes were, or are they just talking about um, how, how nice the design is, or how successful, like, you know, what, 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 were they, what were the key outcomes, I think is, is really important. Um, yeah. And then I think the other thing is, is like how, how they've overcome like problems and stuff. So, you know, if, 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 if you're speaking to people and everything just seems really good, like they talk about their projects and it's all just great. And you just kind of think, well, where's the, where's the messiness? Do they embrace that messiness? You know, cause that's, that's super important. Right. And that's the reality of most projects, right? Nothing ever ever goes as smoothly as some portfolios try to portray. Well, I've, <laughs> and I've been banging this drum to the uh, students that I'm teaching at the moment, you know, because we're, we're, you know, we're going through the double diamond and I'm like, look, yes, we're talking about the double diamond because it helps us talk about um, the kind of frameworks we can use and the process. But, mm -hmm. but in reality, it never works in this way. It's always like you're moving around sort of thing and it's, 
then yes, you have to skip stuff. Uh, and sometimes there's stakeholders that want to push you to do to skip things, and you've got to kind of you've got to understand how to uh, overcome that, overcome difficult situations. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I mean, going back to, I mean, we started to touch on portfolios again a little bit just there. Yeah. But is there anything in particular that you, you tend to look out for in a portfolio that you think is like an absolute must have? I think always start with the, the impact or the outcome. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you don't have a lot of time looking for, through portfolios. Sometimes you're looking through, like, you might be looking through 20 a day. So always start with, like, what, did this, what, was, the, what was the outcome? What did it achieve? You know, what was the metric? Uh, that, you, that, 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 that you kind of changed uh, mm -hmm. and then kind of go into a bit more detail but just start with that I would say first of all because that kind of hooks you in you go okay well, yeah. I'd like to know a little it bit more gives you the context yeah uh, and the other thing is that if you can show the problems you've overcome or what you learn that you wasn't expecting in user research for example I don't want to see like personas or loads of post-it notes and stuff it's just it doesn't mean anything mm. uh, but if you can somehow show like what you learned or the journey you went on or, you know, then that's, 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 that's more important as well. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And then the final question for you is what advice would you give to other design leaders uh, or managers who are looking to foster strong cultures within their teams? I'd say the first, I've got a couple. The first one I would say is embrace partnerships across the business. And I know that's not necessarily related to uh, building, you know, a strong culture within your team, but, I think having strong partnerships with product and engineering mm. uh, can kind of make or break the team in a way because you know you're, 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 all you're trying to do as a design leader really is, is, is create space for your team to get good design done or to work on the most important projects that are going to have the most impact. Um, and if you don't do that, you know you could create the best culture within your team, but eventually they're going to get frustrated or they're going to find roadblocks. So you've got to kind of work across that level so with your partners to ensure that your team can do its best work. And I think teaching your designers that partnerships is key from the very beginning. It's just as you move up the ladder, they're just different partners. So maybe at the right at the beginning, it might be, you know, other designers research. Then it's then it becomes product managers. You know, having a really good partnership with product management is key your product manager and developers, right? You know, and, uh, and then as you move to a more senior designer, it's like your tech leads and again, kind of senior PMs um, and then head of design, then it's like, you know, head of products, head of engineering. Mm. So those partnerships are key along, along your journey, really. And, and to build those partnerships, what did you find were like the most effective methods? Because in, I mean, some organizations, they're, they're almost, it's almost, it's already built there for you. In others, there's a bit of a battle to get those, you know, those teams working together better. I mean, I don't know what the situation was like at Bud, but did you find there was anything in particular that really helped to build those partnerships stronger? You just got to make a real effort. Like, yeah. uh, and there was there there will be certain roles that find it hard. You you might find it harder to connect with. You know, product mm. normally you should be able to connect with quite easily, but maybe engineering sometimes. Uh, it can can be quite difficult to find the kind of common common goals and maybe business people as well. Sometimes but you've got to work really hard at it. You've got to be empathetic to what they're trying to achieve. I yeah. always start from, I always always start those conversations with, okay, so what are you, what are your goals? What are your what are you trying to achieve this quarter or, or this year? How can we help you? How can I help you? You know, start from that, and that oh, that's sorts of gets things going because they're like, okay, you know, yeah, they're, they're interested in what I'm, what, what my, what my targets are and stuff. And maybe, yeah. maybe they hadn't thought that design could help, but actually they can. Yeah, yeah. It's a two-way relationship and you're showing it to them. The last thing I'd say is, it sounds a bit simplistic and I've kind of underlined it here, <laughs> exclamation marks, is uh, be a good line manager. So I am uh, working with uh, a startup at the moment. We're working within the kind of employee well-being an employee engagement space mm -hmm. and they've done a bit of research recently and they we, we sat down the other day and they told me that the biggest cause of stress or kind of um, mental health uh, problems in the in the workplace is is down to line managers so their line manager not being good supportive um, you know not understanding you know their, their, their problems and stuff and mm. I mean to be honest I don't know how many line managers you've had in your in your time. Yeah. So yeah how many have you had? Ten, maybe? 
probably less, well, to be fair, less than 10, but more than five. I okay. Count and how many, can you, how many were actually really good or good? I, I know you don't want to throw anyone under the <laughs> yeah, bus. Yeah, exactly. I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus. Uh, probably only a couple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had, I think I've had 10 and, and maybe two have been good. Mm. Maybe. Like, and, and you most speak to most people. Yeah. It's the same. And it's like, that's madness if you think about it. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. But then, in the, and it's, funnily enough, it's a common problem in every industry. Yeah. Management is not something that is necessarily trained particularly well. It's often just the next step in the career ladder for most careers. It is common in every industry, but I would say it's, and maybe I'm biased, but I'd say it's most important in design because design is probably one of the only departments in a company that has to always reinforce the need for them being there, right? And no one's going to question um, you need a marketing or, or, or a product or engineering, but people sometimes will question, or oh, why do we need so many designers? Or why do we need uh, design involved in this sort of thing still? Mm. Um, and so you're always fighting that as a designer, right? And so you need, you need a strong design leader. You need, a, you need someone that's, that, that really understands what you're going through. And you, 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 you need to be empathetic to... to to their situation. And, and, and most design managers I've had uh, are kind of forced into line management. Like they just wanted, they just want to design still, yeah. or they want to be an IC and that's absolutely fine. Uh, and some of the design managers I've had unbelievable design designers or head of designs, but they didn't really want to do the line management. And so if you put in that position or if you're asked to put in that position, I would say, you know, first of all, you know, do you really care about people? And I don't mean like everyone cares about people, but if you, you need to really care about people because they're going to come to you with all your all their problems. Yeah. Outside of work as well. You you have to be you have to be a therapist. You've got to be, you know, <laughs> you know, so if you if if you're the kind of person that kind of says, you know, stop making excuses, you know, I just need to do the work as a first point, line management probably isn't for you. And that's fine. Mm. And that's absolutely fine. And then the other thing I would say is like, are you the kind of person that wants to have tough uh, is okay with having tough conversations difficult conversations because there's some people that just don't want to have those kind of conversations who would rather just let things go and i think you've got to be at one hand really empathetic and really kind of um you know in tune with 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 the people you're managing and secondly you've got to be prepared to say what needs to be said when yeah. it needs to be said you've got to have those tough conversations you've got to give that feedback constantly but often help them understand and grow because that's what they really appreciate and then the third thing i would say is embrace being managed up as well because uh especially if you're thrown into uh line management for the first time first the one thing i did which which i would say to all early line managers to do is to ask for feedback all the time so yeah. every one one-to-one -one session i would say okay what am i doing that's helping you and what am i doing that's not helping you uh, what could I be doing more of, right? And to really create that open conversation, to really create that kind of honest and open environment and, and really ask for that kind of feedback. Because mm. what I learned quite quickly when I started line managing was I was micromanaging, which I think most managers People do, do. the first time. But I learned quite quickly because I was asking. You know, and they were like, yeah, you, you're just always around. Yeah. And you're just, you're just constantly... But that comes with that growth mindset, right? Yeah, I guess. Looking for the feedback yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, to improve. 100%. Yeah. Um, I mean, very quickly, we'll wrap up in a second, but the, I mean, it, it's really invaluable advice to tell people to, you know, think about whether or not line management is actually right for them or what they want to be doing. But it can take a lot of sort of, I suppose, self-reflection to identify that in an individual. What advice would you give to the people being managed by people who might not be the best line managers in order how to manage up a bit better? Oh, <laughs> sorry, mate. I, I, I would say try and, yeah, try and be honest with them and say, tell them what you need. Tell them what you need. Tell them, like, you need more of this to be able to do your job. And then hopefully they, they listen. They listen. Yeah, that's yeah. what you can do. Awesome. Well, it, thank you very much for coming down and talking to us. No uh, it's been a pleasure. Really, really insightful conversation. Uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more from you in the future. Great. Nice one. Cheers, Sam. Nice one. <laughs> Thank you for coming down. <laughs>